I want to tell you two things before we get started this morning. We'll pick it up in verse 15. There are two assumptions I make when I study and prepare to teach this fellowship. Assumption number one is you can handle it. Um, I reject the notion that people can handle 15 to 20 minutes of teaching and then that's it. I, I don't accept that. We have college classes that last an hour and a half, you know. I mean, you can handle it. And besides the fact that after 13 years, this is a fellowship who is well read in the scriptures. So I kind of bank on that. I make that assumption. But I also make a secondary assumption. Actually, it's probably uh, the first assumption, the more important one. And that is that the Holy Spirit is sufficient to teach us everything we need to know. And so when we get into some of the passages, like we're going to talk about this morning, there's some, there is some processing that needs to take place. And I, I don't even think the word really is thinking. It's processing. We pray, I pray, for the download, the revelation of the Spirit of God to help us to wrap our minds around these things and to really get it into our hearts. But sometimes we just need time to process, and this passage is is one of those. In fact, the further we get into the letters of Paul, the more you're going to say, wow, Paul, there's a period here somewhere, I just know it. You know, you're going to get to the end of the sentence someday. Um, So follow with me, and we're going to think through this. Uh, the, The great thing about this teaching this morning is there's a very practical story And then there's the follow-up to it. Well, we're going to begin with the follow-up. So that's verse 15. Paul, writing, says, We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Ouch. (laughs) Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of law. Since by the works of law, no flesh will be justified. I want to point something out real quickly just so you know why I'm doing this. Every time you see the word the before law, it's not there. There's no definite article in the Greek. So what Paul is saying is something that I believe is actually broader than Torah. That yes, it would include the concept, the idea of Jewish law, the law. But Paul's not saying the law. He's saying law. Man is not justified by works of law, is what he's saying. Verse 17. But if, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister, a servant of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild what I have destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through law, I died to law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through law, then Christ died needlessly so Holy Spirit now download fill our hearts with with revelation fill our minds with understanding and teach us more of your grace we pray in Jesus name Amen Amen. isn't it good to know that once you start following Jesus all conflicts and disagreements just disappear (laughs) (laughs) You know what? The truth is we don't suit up when we come to faith in Jesus. We don't suddenly become super Christians with new relational powers. You know, I think sometimes people actually think that. Like in the non-Christian world, they think that we Christians think that we're better. Or even among Christians, we think that we've now come to this new place. Hey, we are born again, but we're still in skin. And that's something to keep in mind. We don't suddenly have these superpowers, you know, faster than a spiteful bullet. More powerful than a lethal motive. I like that one. Able to leap tall bickerings in a single bound. You know the truth. You know that conflict happens. You know that confrontations and arguments, and and we rub each other the wrong way, even in the church. Even among Christians. Even in Christian households, with the exception of mine. (laughs) 
I'm born again, but still in skin. And what I love about the Bible, God's word, the inspired word of God, is it presents real people with real world problems, which includes disputes and disagreements and even inconsistencies and hypocrisy. We see this on the pages of Scripture. I mean, when did God ever promise immunity from these things but in heaven itself? These are a reality. And so this is a divine book to human recipients. God dealing with life as it is, inviting us to life as it can be, as he promises one day it will be. Jesus said in John 17, 15, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. And so we are sent and we are sanctified, born again, but still in skin. And so we don't, I don't know, what is the phrase? Put on airs. You know, we don't think more highly of ourselves than we ought. We don't assume ourselves to be perfect people, just pursuing holiness. Desiring to be, yes, perfect and righteous in Christ Jesus. And we recognize that our righteousness and our goodness comes from Christ Jesus and not from ourselves. The reason I tell you all this is this morning we come to a sharp confrontation, a class clash of, of titans, if you will. Uh, maybe not so much between a Batman versus Superman, but you could say Aquaman versus the Man of Steel. Very easily, Aquaman would be Peter. You know, the big-hearted fisher of men. The fisherman out of Galilee, so we'll call him Aquaman. And then you've got Paul, who I think we could call the man of steel because he is the steely-eyed forehead of flint. I mean, Paul is unswerving in his faith. He, Man, he... I've said several times as we've gone through his letters, I think he lived in a different place once he got saved. I, I see, and I'm not elevating Paul to a stature above any of us as saints and followers of God, but he seemed to live on a different plane, a different reality once he met Jesus. And his eye was on the prize, and he didn't seem to waver. But these two pillars of Christian faith, Peter and Paul, and one surprising face off between them. You may know the story, but. Remarkably, it's a story that many Christians even today are completely unfamiliar with. And it happened at Antioch, the city in which we were all first called Christians, Peter and Paul. Now, the relationship between these two is interesting, to say the least. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call it strained, but I also wouldn't say that they were chummy. Okay, Peter had his ministry, Paul has his ministry, they cross paths a number of times, but they're very unique. In fact, you know what's marvelous? When you look at the early leaders of the church in the New Testament, they're all unique. Some of you love John, because John really resonates, you know. Some love Peter because, man, I trip as often as he did. You know, others love Paul because they like the black and white and the hard and fast, and God used all these various and different people that we might understand and relate. But what's most marvelous of all is that above all these people, there's Jesus to whom we can all come and relate and understand and love and and seek. But these two, Peter and Paul, I'm equally thankful for both men. And please understand as we go through this confrontation that while one of them is very definitely in the wrong, I'm not placing one above the other. We're just taking Scripture at face value and understanding what took place. Let me give you the background coming into chapter uh, 2, verse 11, which is where we're going to be in a moment. Paul, Barnabas, and Titus, their Gentile protege, went from Antioch up to Jerusalem to discuss the issue of the gospel and the Gentiles. This now had become an issue in the church because the gospel had gone out beyond Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and was starting to reach into the ends of the earth, starting to get into these regions that were far more Gentile and far less Jewish. And so the issue, of course, would have to come up. And we've been talking about there were disputes over the keeping of the law, over Torah. How much should a Gentile be required to keep what a Jew 
was previously required to keep. And, and what about the Jews themselves? Are they required to continue down this line or is this a new thing? And these were the things that they had to deal with and talk about. So Paul and Barnabas and Titus went up to Jerusalem and the meeting went really well. There was good understanding. Facts were presented. Grace was recognized. Hands were extended. In fact, if you look at verse 9 of chapter 2, Paul writes, Recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas, that's Peter, and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. That's interesting. Did you note that Paul does not mention whether or not they gave the right hand of fellowship to Titus? Kind of makes you wonder. I would assume they did, but was it an oversight here that Paul forgot to mention that Titus also was given the right hand of fellowship? 1,500 years of Jewish law, of Jewish tradition. Man, that made Gentile inclusion into a complex uh, issue for the early church. And especially for its primarily Jewish leadership. So in Jerusalem, you know this conversation was a big deal for the overall church. But it was after this meeting, discussing these very issues, that Peter makes a visit to Antioch. Coming down from Jerusalem, making his way north, comes to Antioch, and at first... The fellowship is warm. You know, the greetings are all around. The koinonia, it was inclusive. Peter was enjoying meals with all the brethren in Antioch. Jewish or Gentile didn't make a difference. Meals were important in the early church. They're important to me as well. But in the early church, you know, supper was significant. Still is in the Middle East. In a way that is different than here. Dining is a very personal thing. We've talked about that in Arab homes. You come into an Arab home to dine, you are under the protection of that home. You come into a Jewish home to dine, and it's even more intense. It is so intimate. Far more intimate than we tend to think of a meal. Some of you recall this, that... In Jewish thinking, especially in the first century, to eat with someone, to break bread with someone, was to take of the same matter and put it into your body that they put into their body, thus making you biologically similar in a depth of intimacy that sharing a food, a bread together, could only do. So it it was, it meant an awful lot to sit down and eat. Plus, add to that in the early church. That the vast uh, majority of meals, when they took fellowship together, they concluded that fellowship with the Lord's Supper. They would eat together and then they would break bread, which wasn't just a synonym for dinner, but they actually would break bread, remember the Lord Jesus, pass the goblet or the glass of wine, share that together as koinonia, as fellowship, as communing with the Lord. By the way, I think that's a great idea. Would that the church today, that we would do that. Go out to dinner, and then back to someone's home to break bread in communion. Have someone over for dinner, and then finish the meal with communion. But they did this. And so the meals that they would take together were very personal, and yet something in these meals went amiss when Peter came to Antioch. Let's pick it up in verse 11. Paul says, but when Cephas, that's Peter, Came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. Verse 12. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. What's the deal, Peter? Well... Coming back to this mindset of the Jews of the first century, to eat with a Gentile was to make yourself unclean. Now, you won't find that in the law. You will find the Lord saying, come out from among them and be clean. Come out from among them and be perfect. Distinguish yourselves. But Torah, once written, was added to and multiplied into all sorts of various traditions. And among those traditions was you don't eat with a Gentile. Because you share that kind of intimacy with a Gentile and you now are filthy. You are unclean. 
So Jews didn't eat with Gentiles. Peter comes up to Antioch. He's a Christian, right? But he's a Jew. And, and Christianity itself as a separate issue was not even a thing, not yet. It was just Judaism fulfilled, Judaism in its extension, Judaism as intended, but now it's going out. And so Peter comes up and he's eating and he's dining and, and man, he was the first, line, first man in line at the barbecue. Enjoying, enjoying a little Greek salad, maybe some souvlaki, you know, a little lamb on a spit. And Peter was supping and dining, and then this other delegation comes from Jerusalem. And Aquaman sank into Jewish elitism. Peter pulled back. Peter pulled back, and Paul stepped up. Paul was ticked. Paul, and you can tell from the letter that he's writing here, remember this, while he's recounting this, is a letter to the church, to the churches in Galatia. And he's fuming mad at what Peter is doing. Why? Because Peter stood condemned. As we'll see further down in the chapter, Paul didn't even pull Peter aside and go, look, Peter, this isn't a good idea. In the presence of everyone, he confronts Peter. Everyone's watching. I mean, can you imagine how uncomfortable? (laughs) Paul going after Peter? Awkward. Paul was upset. Why? Because Peter stood condemned. Now, when it says, note this, because he stood condemned, that's not the same word that we saw back in Galatians 1.8, where he says, if anyone should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. We tend to think of the word of condemned as a curse. If you say someone is condemned, you're saying they're going to hell. You're saying that person is damned. I mean, you're you're applying curse to them. That's not the word here. The word for condemned is katagonosko. Now, if, if you've done any Greek thinking, even over the years, just hearing some of these words, the words are typically, a lot of them are put together to express something. Kata and gnosko. Gnosko simply means knowing. And and kata means down from, okay? But put them together, and what the word means that is translated here, condemned, is to be at fault. Peter was at fault. Peter was in the wrong. So much for the infallibility of the first pope. (laughs) Peter was in the wrong. He knew what was right, but he kata gnoskoed. He came down from knowledge. He came down from what he knew was the right thing to do. He stepped back from it. You could put it this way. He knew better, but he acted against what he knew was right. And we have a word for that, don't we? Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Peter was playing the hypocrite. And the sole reason, as we read just these two verses, that Peter suddenly becomes aloof is that he feared how this was going to look in the presence of these certain men from James. These guys, these reps of the Jerusalem Mother Church. Now, understand, this doesn't necessarily mean that James himself was uptight. Men from James. Oh yeah, James, that religionist. No, the Bible never says that. And in fact, when you come to the letter from James, he makes a great explanation of of faith and work and how how that actually works. James, we're talking about not the apostle, but the brother of Jesus, who became a pillar in the Jerusalem church. Paul is using this phrase, and it is an interesting choice. These men from James come, and Peter pulls back because of these men from James. Perhaps he feared what they would think or what word would come back to Jerusalem. But why does Paul say this? What he's doing here is he's showing that hypocrisy can even come from what seems to be a legitimate source. What do you mean? I mean, someone being hypocritical because they say, well, our denomination says, you know, or, well, my tradition teaches, I know it's wrong, but my tradition teaches, so I'm going to go with my tradition. That's hypocritical. Someone says, well, but my pastor thinks, (laughs) my pastor thinks, our church leaders say, listen, Hebrews 13, 17 does say obey and submit to church leaders. What it doesn't say is blindly follow them. You better know what you believe. 
and not make assumptions because a pastor says it or a shepherd says it or a denominational tradition or board declares it. Because I'll tell you what, in recent years, many of the mainline denominational boards have been absolutely wrong. One has to do with what we talked about last week, and that is entire denominational boards buying into the boycott, divest, and and sanction movement against Jerusalem, against Israel. That's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. Yeah, but my but my denominational tradition, my board says that, so so I've got to do it. Do you know it's wrong? Well, yeah, hypocrite. It's hypocrisy. It's coming down from what you know. I know this to be true, but yeah, I, I can't I can't follow through with that. Always test what any kind of leadership says against the word of God, and what you want to ask is. What does Jesus say? What does Jesus teach? What does the Word of God declare? That is our standard. Now, Peter's problem here, it taps into something that we have seen before in Peter. I I think enough that you could say it's a personal flaw in the man. By the way, did you notice what Paul suddenly starts calling Peter here? Cephas. Why is that? Well, it's Peter's name. Well, I, under, I understand that's it's another way to say Peter, but why all of a sudden is it Cephas in other places in this same letter? He refers to him as Peter. And later in the letter, he will again refer to him as Peter. And in other letters of Paul, he tends to just say Peter, and we see Peter in the book of Acts, and we hear about Peter. But Cephas, why, why Paul, are you using this word Cephas? I thought about this. The only thing I can figure is that this is the way Jesus said his name. Well, what do you mean? I thought Jesus called him Peter. No, Jesus called him Cephas. Because Jesus spoke primarily in Aramaic. And Cephas is the Aramaic of Little Rock. Peter is, is the Greek, Petros. For Little Rock. But Cephas is the Aramaic, and Jesus spoke Aramaic. John chapter 1, verse 42 tells us Andrew brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. Probably would have said, You're Shimon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas. And then John writes, Which is translated Peter. Well, why does John say that? Because Jesus spoke Aramaic, and Cephas is the Aramaic. Peter is the Greek. Either way, his name is a little rocky. (laughs) But this makes me think, not of Peter, the pillar of the church, but it makes me think of Cephas, a disciple of Jesus, a man with, well, I'll call it a fatal flaw. Turning your Bibles back to Luke 22. Luke 22. Luke chapter 22, verse 54. Having arrested him, they led him away and brought him to the house of the high priest. But Peter was following at a distance. After they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter was sitting among them. And a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the firelight and looking intently at him, said, This man was with him too. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. Kata Gnosko, gang. Uh... I do not gnosko him. I don't know him. Peter, you're coming down from what you know. You're playing the hypocrite. Verse 58, a little later, another saw him and said, You are one of them too. And Peter said, Man, I am not. He does it again. After about an hour had passed, another man began to insist, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him, Before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly hypocrisy hypocrisy is often unintended and I don't know about you but when I play the hypocrite even if I'm not thinking about it in the moment that I'm hypocritical soon afterwards it hits me what I did and I know 
that I just completely ignored what I have claimed to be true. And I believe that's the way it was with Peter. I don't think he ever intended, ever intended to play the hypocrite, whether it be in the courtyard of the high priest or at, with the church in Antioch. He didn't intend to do it. And granted, on that dark night, fear was certainly a factor for Peter. He's in the courtyard. If they pin him as being with Jesus, they might pin him with Jesus up on a tree. So, so Peter's afraid, understood, but Peter's flaw was fatal for Jesus. Fatal flaw. Hypocrisy is just that tendency to buckle under pressure, uh, to cave in to intimidation. Note this, hypocrisy is people-pleasing. It's people-pleasing. You might call it the art of appeasement. Changing my behavior in violation of personal beliefs so that I will blend in with the crowd. And as I said before, hypocrisy is not always deliberate. In fact, often it's not. It's more often a, an unintended response to pressure or temptation. But what it all comes down to, what hypocrisy finds at its root, is who do you want to please? Who do you desire to please? Who will you give in to? Family? i got to go with them. They're my family. Yeah, but what, is, what they're doing is wrong. Yeah, but I, 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 it's family. Who do you want to please? You want to please friends? And you're with them and they're going one direction. Do you go that direction even if it violates conscience? The community around us? The church? What if the church is in the wrong? What do you do then? If any of these, no matter how significant or important in our lives, if any of these are opposed to Jesus, who are you going to please? This is why I call Paul the man of steel. Paul who said back in Galatians 1 verse 10, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men, striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Now that's the third time I've read you that verse in a couple of weeks. Because it is so important and it is so important to me personally. You see, I don't pan Peter here. Pan Peter, Peter Pan. I, I don't think that way about Peter. When I read this story and I see that Peter stood condemned and he was in the wrong as he truly was, I don't sit here and go, oh, Peter, come on. I say, oh, Peter, I get it. If I was the Jew from Jerusalem, gone up to Antioch, everything in my heart would want to dine with everyone until my friends came. And then I could see myself pulling back just like Peter. In fact, one of the things that really unnerved me when I recognized it in myself as a young man was this people-pleasing. This desire to just, I just wanted everybody to be happy. I want to make sure everybody gets along and everything's fine. And if you're, you're of a different opinion than me, well, I'll, I'll bend, I'll float that way. I think a lot of us perhaps in younger years were like that. But it worried me. It truly did. I thought, Lord, I, I, I want to please you, not man. But I don't like how it feels when I displease people around me. That was something I spent a lot of time praying about growing up. I get Peter. And I realized that the only thing that overrides the desire to please people is the greater desire to please Jesus Christ. And if I seek always to please him, first and foremost, I may at times displease people. I may upset people. Paul did. Why was Paul so steely-eyed in his determination? Because his eyes were on Jesus. Because he wanted to please Jesus. Because as we talked about Wednesday, he had revelation of Jesus. And for Paul, that was everything in his world. It changed everything. And that is a great uh, antidote to hypocrisy. And that is the desire to please Jesus and Jesus first and foremost. Well, back in Antioch, Peter's self-condemning hypocrisy wasn't the only thing at stake. A bigger problem arises out of this. In Luke chapter 12, verse 1, Jesus said it this way. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And then he defines it for us, which is hypocrisy. 
Beware of the legend, uh, uh, the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Okay, so the word hypocrisy there, where Jesus uses it, is hupokresis. It's, it's, we just draw it straight out of the Greek. Hupokresis, hypocrisy. And it literally means it was the word in the Greek used of actors. An actor on the stage was called a hupokresis. In that case, you could say Hollywood is filled with hypocrites today. (laughs) But listen, the word Paul uses when he says, verse 13, that the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, and he'll use the word hypocrisy here twice, is not hupokresis. It's actually sun hupokrinomai. It's based off of hupokresis, actor, but it's sunupokresis, which in essence means to act hypocritically together in a group. It's what we would call joint hypocrisy. It's group think. It's mass hypocrisy all together. Jesus compared hypocrisy to leaven because second thing to note about hypocrisy, it's pervasive. It's not just about you being a people pleaser. It's about you poisoning those around you or me poisoning those around me. It's pervasive. One man's hypocrisy. Look at verse 13. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. They're all pulling back from the non-Jewish believers. They're dissociating themselves from the Gentile Christians at Antioch. How did that make the Gentile believers feel? What did that do to the church, at least in the short term? Here comes Peter, a pillar of Jerusalem. And he starts to pull back. What's going on? And then the rest of the Jews there in Antioch start pulling back. And the Gentiles are going, what what do we do? Do we do something wrong? Is Is this about us? I mean, do you think the non-Jewish believers didn't figure it out pretty fast? That what we read now, 2,000 years later, as a moment of hypocrisy, all they felt was hurt. All they felt was cut off. All they felt was discluded. And I wonder, and this is completely surmised, so let me step out just for a moment and say, I'm just, I'm just extrapolating in my mind, but I really wonder if there were believers, Gentile believers in Antioch, who were saying, am I illegitimate as a Christian? You know, did did I miss something? Am I doing something wrong here? Am I just never going to be able to be what the Jewish Christians are? Few things sat in my heart more than hearing a brother or sister wonder if they've done something to lose God's favor. And I hear it from time to time. I was praying on Wednesday night. With a brother who was saying, I think I'm missing something I, I, because I, I must be doing something wrong here. And my heart just breaks because, man, that, that mentality, that, that is the enemy saying, yeah, you did something wrong. You're out of grace. You're not in God's favor. You must be, The problem's got to be with you. I, I'm telling you, gang, the Gentile Christians must have been feeling like the problem was them. And it was because of Peter's hypocrisy. But man, it's even worse when one believer's or or entire gang of believers' hypocrisy causes someone else to question their faith. Peter's hypocritical. People-pleasing. And then all of a sudden it becomes pervasive with all the Jews until, well, Barnabas himself. Barnabas. Perhaps the most surprising person in this story is Barnabas. You know what his name means? The son of encouragement. And he's pulling back. Luke described him in Acts 11.24 as a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. You can be baptized in the Holy Spirit and be a hypocrite. Born again, still in skin. Right? Right? So here's Barnabas pulling back. And and Kenneth Weiss, he puts it this way. He calls his defection even more serious than Peter's waffling because Barnabas, quote, the foremost champion of Gentile liberty next to Paul had become a turncoat. It was Barnabas who went to Tarsus to get Paul and bring him back to Antioch to preach the gospel. 
It was the duo of Paul and Barnabas who were building this church by the Spirit in Antioch of Jews and Gentiles. Like it was Barnabas and Paul who had gone down to Jerusalem to talk about the Gentile situation and to say, look, God is accepting the Gentiles. And now when Peter comes up and pulls back hypocritically and the rest of the Jews pull back, Barnabas pulls back. And hypocrisy is pervasive. And I wonder if there wasn't a ripple effect here. That maybe this was the moment that started the break between Paul and Barnabas. This is the conflict that began that one. Acts 15.39, which by the way happens just after this, says there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. Paul took Silas and he went up around the horn. I understand. I know that the disagreement between Barnabas and Paul was over whether they should take a flighty John Mark. You know, Barnabas wanted to give him a second chance and Paul didn't want to. I know that that's the background. However, is it possible that the very relationship between Paul and Barnabas had already begun to sour because of this hypocrisy? Because remember, Paul doesn't let it go. Verse 14. When I saw that they, that is Peter, Barnabas, and all the Jews, were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? How can you do this, hypocrite? And he was being hypocritical. He was coming down from what he knew to be true. Verse 15, then Paul says, and I believe here still talking to Peter and all the gang gathered, we are Jews by nature and and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Now Paul says that because that was a Jewish mentality. Paul's not saying that he thinks the Gentiles are worse sinners. But he is being ironic here because the Jewish mentality was that. Gentiles are sinners and we are Jews. That was the, the, you know, the dividing line, Jews and sinners. And he goes on, he says, nevertheless, verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed, we Jews have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of law, since by works of law, no flesh will be justified. That is Paul's statement, by the way, to any Christian who either claims to be saved by their own personal holiness or fears they are not saved because they're not as holy as other people. You're not saved based on you. We're saved based on Christ, based on faith in Him. The faith of the messed up sinner who just says, Jesus, I am helpless without you, is a greater faith than that of the righteous person saying, been a pretty good week, hasn't it, Lord? It is faith in Jesus. Because law, any law, can never justify flesh. Well, why is that? Because you can't keep enough law to justify yourself. No Jew could. Of the 613 laws of Torah and the extrapolated laws that went on beyond that of Talmud and Mishnah, you can't keep all that stuff. Good luck trying. And among us as Gentiles, all of the standards and values and morality, I'm not saying, don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying we don't keep law. We don't, you know, try to do the right thing. I'm just saying we can't. We can't. And behind this ugly hypocrisy was the issue of legalism, which we see Paul battling throughout this letter to the churches in Galatia. Legalism, which has a way of undermining love. And yes, in the church. I would tell you, my opinion, the number one reason why love fails in the church is legalism rises up. Well, we can't abide this because that violates our law. And so we cease to love. Hypocrisy, note this number three, is pretension. It's pretension. It's always a put on, always a mask, always a game, it's always acting, and it is self-deception. Because again, the Jews could no more keep their own law than the Gentiles could. 
faithfulness to the things we've been talking about, feasts and, and circumcision and keeping the Sabbath. You, you can't do all that and, and be good enough. So, in response to this, someone might say, what are we supposed to do then? Just throw it all out? Just live as rabid sinners? Send big and go home? I mean, you know, what are we supposed to do? Is God's grace then licensed to sin? Peter anticipates, or I'm sorry, Paul, Paul anticipates that kind of thinking. And in verse 17 he says, But if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister, a servant of sin? May it never be! Paul answers the question right there, those who say, Wait a minute, you call yourself a Christian, but you still sin? So is Jesus an acceptor, a servant of sinners? No, you're you're missing the point, Paul says. That's not the issue. What if I live by this grace in Christ? Let me back up from this. Grace scares people to death. In the church, we love it at the outset because it saves us. But when it comes to actually disseminating rules and regulations in a church fellowship, grace is scary. How much grace do we give? When do we say enough is enough? You need to be righteous now. I mean, what's the line? How do we know? And so we come to this issue of grace. And and what if we are a church that preaches grace, but turn into a bunch of filthy sinners because we all just know we're saved by grace. And the reality is it doesn't work that way. My living by grace does not implicate Jesus in my sin. That's ridiculous. And you know what else is ridiculous? Rebuilding the law. That's even more ridiculous. Verse 18. For if I rebuild what I have destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. That is, if I go back to law and this kind of legalism and start to build it up again and live by that, guess what? My sin gets bigger. Because my sin becomes even more apparent. Verse 19. For through law... I died to law so that I might live to God. Okay, Paul, wow. What are you saying here? He's just saying in essence that a return to law is a return to sin. Pure and simple. As he wrote in Romans 5.21, the law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And this is perhaps the single greatest explanation of a Christian's attitude of living of any in Scripture. And it's this. Listen, when Jesus died, he fulfilled law. He fulfilled requirement. He fulfilled all rules of righteousness in and of himself. And he nullified my self-righteousness for his grace. And when Paul says, as he does in verse 19, through law I died to law so I might live to God, what he's saying is what he'll say later in the book. Through law, that is the law brought me to Jesus, that I might die to the law that brought me to Jesus, so that I can live in Jesus. What the law did was serve as a tool of God to get me where I realized I need grace. And once I realized that, there's Jesus saying with open arms, I got your grace. I have it for you. Paul (laughs) answers this whole issue with one of the most profound things I believe he ever said. Verse 20. For I have been crucified with Christ. How'd you die to the law, Paul? I've been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. And Jesus is that marvelous power to overcome sin. His grace then, please get this, his grace is my motivation to pursue holiness. That's why we want to live righteously, because I have his grace. So now I'm free to try. And fail. And try again and fail some more. Because I live in grace, not under law. And that does everything. That's what made Paul so steely-eyed. He understood grace. He recognized how vile he was toward God, toward Jesus, and toward the church. And yet, Christ's grace saved him. 
And living in that grace, Paul was on fire for righteousness and holiness and, and perfection because of grace. It was the entire motivation. And when sin tempts hypocrisy in your life, in my life, you say this, I've been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And I'm not going to subject this body to sin when this is the house of Jesus. When Christ lives in me, I'm going to live for him. I want to be a a, a messenger of Christ. I want to be a vessel of Christ. I want Jesus to be all over me. And this is so absolutely crucial. The grace of God in Jesus. It's so crucial to a Christian, to following Jesus, that Paul made a public case out of it. In the presence of all, he goes after Peter and all the other Jews, and yes, even Barnabas. And you know, Paul didn't stop there. He didn't just make a public case out of it. He wrote it down and sent it to all the churches in Galatia. (laughs) Oh, Paul, man. You know, maybe he went too far. No, because the posterity of the church needed this letter. We need it as desperately today as they needed it then. Now, by the way, you need to understand in the conclusion of the story that Peter got it. In fact, Peter would come along and write one of the most Gentile inclusive letters in the New Testament. He would come to that point of understanding. It's Peter who wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. And he's talking about Gentiles. You're a holy nation of Gentiles. For a Jew to say that is a radical transformation. And Peter wrote that down and invites us into that. Guess what? We're a holy nation. We are a royal priesthood. It's no longer Jews and sinners. It is now Jews, Gentiles, and the royal priesthood of all believers in Christ Jesus, Jew and Gentile alike. But this hypocrisy, if left unattended, the reason why we see Paul get so fired up on this and write an entire letter about it, is if this hypocrisy is left unattended in the church, it threatens the truth of the gospel. And that's where we got to land this morning. The truth of the gospel. Look back at verse 14. Paul writes, When I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I confronted Cephas. When he realized that what was suffering, what was endangered in this moment, the endangered species there in Antioch was the truth of the gospel. When I saw that, I had to stop it. Number four, fourth point, final one. Hypocrisy is prejudicial. It's prejudicial. Prejudice. It pitted Jew against Gentile, elevating one segment of Christians over and above another segment of Christians. What I want you to get, and I think Paul is driving at here, is that the truth of the gospel overrides prejudice of any kind. The truth of the gospel destroys prejudice. You've heard it before. The only level ground is where? At the foot of the cross. At the foot of the cross before Jesus is the only place on the planet in history, the only place where all people are in the exact same place. Everybody equal at the foot of the cross. And Paul would later write in Ephesians 2.14, He is our peace who made both groups into one, who broke down the barrier of the dividing wall, abolishing in his flesh the enmity that is between Jew and Gentile, which is the law of commandments and ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one, establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, 
by it, having put to death the enmity. It was the cross that destroyed this notion of prejudice that we see beginning to bubble up again in Antioch. And what he's saying here, what I believe is is coming across, is there is no place for strife, for enmity, for division, where Jesus is named Lord. Listen to the relevance of this. America 2017 is a deeply divided nation. We recognize this. And so it is a nation, I think more than ever before, that desperately needs the truth of the gospel. And that's our message. The truth of the gospel. Well, okay, you keep saying the truth of the gospel. What exactly is the truth of the gospel? I think Paul defines it for us. Skip ahead to chapter 3, verse 27. Galatians 3, 27. And Paul writes, well, let's start in verse 26. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ, which is a beautiful theological statement we'll get to when we study chapter 3. Verse 28, here's the truth of the gospel. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Notice the relevant categories and think about it in terms of our nation and the church today. Jew and Gentile, race, slave versus free, class, male versus female, gender. Race, class, gender. Are not these the points of contention in American society? Aren't these the very things that there were completely divided opinions about and and claims made one candidate against the other in the last presidential election? The division of race and the division of class and the division of gender? And America fights this out, dupes it out, and doesn't know what to do with all of these different segments of society that are so divided, divided in race, divided in class, divided in gender. How do we deal with this? The truth of the gospel. Let me make it real simple. The truth of the gospel is this. Grace is for everybody who will receive it. That's the only caveat to grace, by the way. Will you receive it? Will you receive the grace of God in Christ Jesus? If you will but receive it, grace is for you. And it doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, where you come from, what your lifestyle has been. doesn't matter. If you will receive the grace of God, grace is for everybody. There are no racial lines in the church. There are no social lines, no gender lines that would divide where there is grace. Christ crucified obliterates division. Completely wipes it out. And that's good news, isn't it? When we talk about the gospel, it's good news. Well, what's good news? Well, Jesus died for me. Well, that's a historical fact. No, it's grace. Grace is good news. But Rick, you might say, I still see division in the nation, and I see division in the church. What about that? I see division in the church, too. You know why? Because of hypocrisy. Because we say one thing, we preach grace, but then we sometimes will live another thing. Paul saw this danger in the early church. The danger, the threat of hypocrisy was a threat to the very truth of the gospel that grace is for everyone. And there is no distinction. Paul saw this, that that hypocrisy would divide the church, ultimately along racial lines, Jew-Gentile, along class lines, the lower class of Roman society, the slaves, and then the upper class that, you know, they would be divided, and then gender lines, male and female. And Paul fought this with steely determination. That was the first day's church. This is the last day's church, and the same threat exists today. The undermining of the truth of the gospel, and we must fight it. We must, like Paul, be men and women of steel, at least when it comes to the gospel. 
And we will preach the gospel and stand on the gospel of grace until Jesus comes. So how do we do that? How do we, how do we fight against division? Which, by the way, is the thing God hates more than anything else. Look it up, Proverbs chapter 6. The Bible teaches a grace alternative to joint hypocrisy. And it is very simply joint integrity. Ephesians 4.15, Paul writes, Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. That's joint integrity. That's a fellowship walking together with love and grace, bearing the truth of the gospel to the world that grace really is for all people. And and, and here's the thing, and I think God's starting to really pull this out, at least in in my heart. As we're studying Galatians, we need to get beyond grace as a theoretical or theological construct. And we need to get to grace as a reality. Grace as a lifestyle of joint integrity in the body of Christ. That we together are going to live by grace. I will in my life, in my family, with my friends pursue grace. I want to pursue grace among uh, this fellowship. And we in the larger church, joint integrity, the integrity of grace in the body of Christ. Verse 21, let's finish, of chapter 2. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through law, then Christ died needlessly. Did Christ die needlessly? You see, when we go back to law, that's what we're saying. When we go back to religion, that's what we're saying. That's the problem of the cults. That's the problem of Mormonism. That's the problem of Jehovah's Witness. That's the problem of even some evangelical churches that become very rigid. Is In essence, what we say when we live by the rules and the regulations is Christ died needlessly. We have to do these things because his death wasn't enough. Really? Or do we in fact believe that Jesus died perfectly, sufficiently to save anyone who will accept His grace? I'll put it this way. Christ only died needlessly for those who live hypocritically. There will be clashes. There will be controversies, there will be confrontations in our marriages, in our families, in our fellowship. And that's going to go on until Jesus comes, because as I said, we're born again, still in skin. But in His grace, by His grace, we throw off the mask of hypocrisy in favor of integrity. And Lord, that's our prayer this morning. That we would truly live by grace. And that you would so take this this concept, a single word, and, and Lord, it is a potent word. That you would take not just the word of grace, but the entire meaning of grace. And and Lord, overwhelm our hearts with grace, with what it means. Grace in the truth of your word. Grace in the love of Christ. We would know grace such that it overwhelms us. That it would leave the pages of debate and the the classrooms of study. And grace would be how we think and how we live and, and how we interact one with another. May we be a people of grace because, Lord, we have been saved by your grace. Oh, thank you, Lord, for amazing grace. We come before you now with hearts of worship and thanksgiving. For your grace in Christ Jesus. Amen. As we, uh, as we worship now, we come to the table of the Lord. This is the recognition of God's grace in Jesus Christ. And a death that was not died needlessly. A sacrifice that did all that was required. So let's worship.
Let's come to the table of the Lord. And if you want to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior this morning, while we sing these songs and while we worship together, come on forward or go to one of the tables and we'll receive you there. Let's stand together.